Hey Pollinator Pals, Beth here. Thanks to the Legacy Amendment, I'm able to come to you from the North Garden here at the Marjorie McNeely Conservatory to share with you one of the sweetest stories of pollination, chocolate. Let's explore the cacao tree and learn about its sweet stories. There are actually three varieties of cacao that can be found throughout the world two of which can be found here in the Marjorie McNeely Conservatory and in Tropical Encounters. These are really cool trees because you can actually see the flowers are coming directly off of the trunk and the stems of the plant. Um, this is called a coliform method of blooming, which is really, really interesting. After these flowers are pollinated, they slowly develop into big pods that grow all the way up the stem. You can see we have some developing further up on one of our trees here. These pods, as they age, are harvested. And there's a really complex process that we've developed over many, many years to properly age and harvest and process the cacao to make all of the many forms of chocolate that we love and enjoy today. Cacao, once the pods are harvested, you can see there's a fleshy pulp as well as the beans, uh, which are the parts that are actually processed into cocoa solids that we enjoy today. Uh, however, both parts are edible and historically, both parts were enjoyed. Cacao has a really long and complex history, which is really, really amazing. It was actually originally domesticated, according to archaeological evidence, as early as the first millennium BC. So over 3,000 years ago, it was uh, considered a sweet treat for the elite of the Aztec Empire. It was actually brewed in a, in a frothy, bitter, spicy drink, which was really delicious. Since then, it was traveled all around the world through European colonization. And this story is complex and has a lot of history behind it, which is continuing to this day. It's a really interesting story, and in, I would encourage adults to learn more by checking out the book Bitter Chocolate by Carol Off. But unfortunately, that story is so long, we're not going to be able to explore that today in our story. We're going to focus on the story of pollination instead. Now, these pods wouldn't exist without their pollinators, and their pollinators are these really cool Seraptogonid midges that are actually found all over the world. There's a species unique to Central and South America that pollinated these plants in the beginning, but since species can be found worldwide, there are pollinators that are able to help provide this pollination service all over the world where the cacao tree has spread. Um, cacao is grown today all across the tropics and subtropics, 20 degrees north or south of the equator. So there's lots of midges to help provide that service so long as we take good care of them. Here in the conservatory, we're far above the tropics here in Minnesota, but we actually seem to be having someone provide that service for us. And you might have encountered this midge yourself. These small, almost invisible midges um, that are sometimes sneak up and take a bite of you without you even seeing them coming might be providing a pollinating service for us here in the conservatory. And it's pretty neat that they've snuck in to help us out. However, when we've tried to expand and maximize our harvest of cacao, we might have gotten ourselves in trouble with these pollinating services and found ourselves in a pollinator gap where there's not enough pollinators to do the job, which can be quite troubling. Studies have found that by clear cutting and deforesting and by the extensive use of wide use pesticides, those midges aren't surviving and thriving, so they're not available to do the job of pollination. But there is hope. Study, a study in Ghana has shown that by actually allowing some of that leaf litter to survive, we've been able to increase midge populations by 500% and our cacao yield in that area by four times. That's a huge difference and really, really important to the success of farming and the preservation of other parts of those rainforests, um, which are really important as well. By also restricting our use of pesticides to not use wide range pesticides and to not use them during 
times that it's very important for the midge's life cycle, they're able to better protect their pollinators so their pollinators can in turn help them out. This is extra important because Ghana and Cote d'Ivoire produce about half of the world's chocolate and that's pretty important. Now there's some huge environmental and also societal important reasons to help protect chocolate, but it's so far away from us it might seem hard for us to do our part, but there's lots of ways we can all help. We can help by being educated and informed consumers and advocates in, in the chocolate that we consume. Keep an eye on the chocolate you buy and look for important labels, such as fair trade, or direct trade, or the terms bean to bar. These are all examples of chocolate that you can find locally that is produced in a way that is sustainable both for people and for pollinators. Through this consumption, we also make sure that more, more of the proceeds from the purchases of chocolate go directly to the people who help produce it, which helps protect them and protect their ecosystem. At the end of the day, getting chocolate that's good for the planet, good for people, and good for pollinators is more than just good. It's downright sweet. Mmm.